What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another breakdown for American Horror Story Hotel. This is episode four, Devil's Night. There are obviously a ton of spoilers in this episode, guys, so make sure you've seen the episode and then hop on back into this breakdown. Also, Finn's joined me. He'll be barking throughout this entire breakdown. Sorry about that. Talk it out. Babble on. Battle for your life. Babble on. Now, before we get into episode four, Greg, I think we got to give a little shout out to someone that hit us up on Twitter regarding something that I said during our episode three breakdown. At Exploding Stove says, watching your American Horror Story season five, episode three video, the art deco decoration on the elevator door is the Conquistador Cortez, like the hotel. Now, Greg, I don't know why I tried to pull it into a, a little hint for <laughs> Roanoke. Uh, it sounded, you should have told me that it sounded a little far-fetched I, at the time. Yeah, but. My, my mascot, uh, was a conquistador for my high school. Uh, I should have said something. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which makes sense, right? Uh, uh, I guess it's Hernando Cortez. Uh, Hernan Cortez was one of a Spanish conquistador. Um, and I guess it makes sense uh, logistically in like location, geographically, that um, the influence would be in uh, you know Southern California region, Los Angeles specifically, um, after I think they c kind of conquered parts of like Mexico um, and all that. So, um, you know, I wanted to make it seem like it was a Roanoke hint, but that's just me being a, a, a nerdy AHS fan, I think. All good. And again, as we mentioned earlier this season, the Hotel Cortez was inspired by Cecil Hotel in Los Angeles, which is allegedly a haunted place due to its really high rate of deaths and violence inside that hotel. So don't stay at scary hotels. Nope. All right, now let's dive into this episode, Devil's Night. Now, Devil's Night is actually the night prior to Halloween, October 30th. Mm -hmm. It was also called, like, Mischief Night in America, especially in Philly uh, during the time period, as well as in the, I think it was the 70s, all the way up to the 90s, where uh, it was mostly associated with vandalism and crime, mostly in Detroit, Michigan. And it wasn't until very later on they tried to change it to Angel's Night. Okay. Yeah, whenever I think of Devil's Night, I always think back to that movie in the 90s, The Crow, in 1994. One of my favorite movies growing up, uh, starring, of course, Brandon Lee. Uh, rest in peace, Brandon Lee. Um, but the whole thing kind of takes place around the days around Halloween and Devil's Night and the destruction, the mayhem, um, the arson. And uh, that movie is extremely dark. Um, I suggest watching it, though. It's, it's a good watch. It's, it's good action. Um, and Brandon Lee's uh, badass as hell. Um, but yeah, Devil's Night, there's a... You know, AHS loves to have these um, episodes, not only that like take place during Halloween, the events surrounding Halloween. It's, mm -hmm. it's such a perfect, obviously a perfect thing for American Horror Story. But also a lot of them do air around because Halloween. the show comes on in the fall. Yeah. We, we sometimes get a show that will air on Halloween night itself, as we've seen in the past. So it's always a fun pastime to kind of have American Horror Story coincide with Halloween. The episode opens with Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker, showing up at the Hotel Cortez. He signs into the guest book and then heads straight on upstairs for some fun. Devil's Night. I have a standing reservation. Now, the real Richard Ramirez, of course, died in 2013 on death row. Um, so this in-canon version for AHS, at least, uh, we have the ghosts floating around Horta Cortez for a little while. That's cool. Yeah, apparently, like, after a serial killer passes away, they're then able to attend Hotel Cortez because it is this hell mouth of sorts um, and they make a uh, they allude to that right that he's been dead for a few years this is his third time I believe um, coming to the Hotel Cortez standing reservation um, but this whole thing is pretty uh, as funny as this horrible topic of serial killers could be um, he doesn't need a key to get in uh, they left him a treat on the bed you know obviously some tourists from Arizona because the Night Stalker would rather he would prefer to just break into a window and just creep in there and kill somebody um, it, it was a, it was a, a pretty funny little nod to just um, you know the 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 ridiculousness of of such a, a guest coming into a hotel. And they also make note of Charlie Manson uh, trying to come to the Hotel Cortez, but he hasn't died yet. He wouldn't die until a year later. Uh, so at some point, I have a feeling we're going to see a ghost of Charlie Manson at the Hotel Cortez or somewhere. It's guaranteed. Yeah, that's for sure, Greg. I mean, we've seen Manson in later seasons of AHS. Now, if we ever go back to Hotel Cortez for some reason, I think it would be, be they, they would tie it all together and put Manson back in, you know, for Devil's Night, have, a, have even more serial killers um, join 
join in on on the uh, you know the the party, the absinthe party that they have. Yeah, we check back in on the Low family where uh, Scarlet calls her dad. Uh, she's hanging out with Grandma right now while the parents figure out their divorce proceedings. We don't know where that's going at the moment. Uh, and John's at the hotel and uh, he's on the call with her, but he notices that there's something weird going on to the walls around him at this hotel. Of course, as you do at a haunted you know hotel, uh, the walls start bleeding. Cool. Yeah, Greg, I mean, we knew like, you know, the mattresses were a problem, the odors coming from the mattresses and the rooms. And then when you have blood coming down the walls, I mean, awesome. Yeah. Zero star hotel, in my opinion. Um, but also, I, I, you know, John Lowe's reaction, his face in this whole scene while he's on the phone is just <laughs> hysterical. It's kind of like the face he has the entire time. <laughs> he's just kind of in a daze and like just like staring off into something else and not really listening to his daughter. That's just normal John Lowe, which is nothing but this. So where is the blood coming from? Well, just go right upstairs and Miss Evers will probably be nearby. I mean, she's cleaning up the blood throughout the Hotel Cortez. And this brings us to a fun little flashback. Well, not so fun, let's be honest. Um, a, a flashback of Los Angeles in 1925. And we learn about, uh, you know, kind of what happened to her and mm -hmm. uh, some context into how she got to the hotel and what she's been dealing with and all that kind of stuff. Now her son, Albert, um, was trick-or-treating with her and then she loses him and he's abducted. Eerily, <clears throat> this completely lines up with pretty much what John Lowe and Alex Lowe have gone through with Holden, right? So they have this, they kind of can connect in this one area of their lives where they understand exactly what each other are going through. The only problem here is that Miss Evers, this happened, you know, a hundred years ago, no, not, not not quite a hundred years ago, but 80 years ago, something like that. So, uh, you know, there's 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 a discrepancy on how the hell is he talking to this person who should be long dead. Um, and we find later on that he kind of, he links the two and he thinks like, wow, this is some supernatural stuff going on, but he's still not completely sold on that thing. Now, since most of this episode takes place on Halloween, we obviously get a nod, a call back to the classic John Carpenter film, Halloween, as we get a cool little POV shot for a moment. We didn't miss that. And speaking of Albert, it turns out sadly that he was connected to the chicken coop murders of that time period, the real life chicken coop murders. They were the Wineville chicken coop murders. Uh, they were a series of child abductions and murders that took place in California in the mid 1920s. Gordon Stewart Northcott was arrested and convicted of the murders of over 20 children. The case was also the basis of that 2008 Clint Eastwood film, The Changeling, uh, with uh, I think it was Angelina Jolie. Also. Dennis O'Hare is in that movie. Oh, never seen it. Damn. You're becoming agitated. Apparently, in, in real life, um, the, the county, the, the city of Wineville actually did change its name, just as we hear in these, this episode as well. Um, Wineville changed its name to Miraloma on November 1st, 1930, because of the negative publicity surrounding the murders, uh, the new cities of Eastvale and Drupa Valley took different parts of the area of Miraloma in 2010 and 2011. So um, such a horrific thing happened to this small town that uh, it, it, it became so closely associated with, with, with the town itself, right? So people were trying to kind of, um, you know, get away from the past and kind of, uh, you know, kind of keep it hidden. They never were sure exactly how many children there were. That is a terrible story. Now, back with Alex Lowe, she has kidnapped, or not even kidnapped, I guess you can't say kidnapped. She, she takes her son, Holden, back home with her. Now, uh, it's not exactly Holden anymore, and um, mm -hmm. we get a shot early of the dog barking at her, uh, who's it, Jasper? Uh, the dog's barking yeah. at Holden. Very good boy. And, and so they put it away. Yep, good boy. And they put it away in the bathroom. And I knew right then and there, uh-oh, <laughs> this, is, this isn't a good sign. Um, so then afterwards, Alex talks to Holden and uh-oh. Yeah, you know what, Greg? Like, I, I've, I, I've sat through a lot of violence and murder on this show. But as soon as this happened, as a new puppy owner, this this just, this just threw me off. I couldn't. I, it was hard to watch. <laughs> It's a I show. mean, Jasper didn't do anything wrong. Jasper was just a little excited. You know, he was obviously on high alert because a vampire just walked in the house. Uh, <laughs> he knows what's up, right? Yes. And then all of a sudden, poor guy gets just thrown in the bathroom, put on timeout, and then he gets eaten. Hold it! What is wrong with you? 
<laughs> Holden said he was hungry. Oh. He said, Mom, Greg co signs on this. Greg, <laughs> no. Greg's okay hey. with this. No, no, Greg's no, no, okay no. With this. no, 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 no now, the one thing that stands out in that scene is that Holden, he really doesn't acknowledge where he is at all, and he wants his other mommy, which, of course, is the Countess. Uh, so it's time to bring him back to the hotel. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure if, like, his brain is wiped completely or if he just lacks the uh, kind of emotional attachment to... The virus. Yeah, like, maybe it just kind of, like, completely turns off all attachment that he had in life prior to this, right? So maybe he... He recognizes his Alex as his first mom, or he rec recognizes the house and the, even the dog, but he doesn't really mm -hmm. have any feelings towards it. You know, he's just kind of neutral about all that. So, you know, it's not really clear if, if he does know what's, what's going on, but clearly all he wants is the Countess, his, his actual new mom. And when Alex does take Holden back to the hotel, he immediately jumps into his box, his own coffin, and goes back to bed because it's, you know, it's daytime. That's what you do as a vampire. Uh, and that's when, of course, the Countess explains to Alex the rules again of what's going on with Holden. He's a vampire now, and you can't, you can't do anything. You can't go to him. You got to come to me here, and you got to join us. And uh, we get back to this a little bit later on at the end of the episode. You know what I liked about this part, and I liked about how the show uses. Um, I like how she calls it a blood disease and or a virus, mm -hmm. I believe, and doesn't say yeah. like he's a straight up vampire. I like that she's, nope. that she, they explain it and say like it's this ancient blood virus, and he's kind of he, he's gone and he's not, never coming back. But you can join him if you wish, and if he's your one true love and, and you, you have this attachment to him, then I mean obviously that's you know the way that, the route that you want to take. In order to get with him, but I like I like that they don't say mm -hmm. straight up. Like a lot of shows, a lot of movies will just be like, "He's a vampire," and I, I kind of like the idea of like not saying they, not they took say, that out of the script. Yeah, not saying the a name vampire and just kind of using it as a kind of the elusive this 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 ancient uh, this ancient like virus that happens that kind of takes over your blood and you become a whole new entity. I do want to shout out some of the set decoration. We have we've talked briefly about this in the beginning of our breakdowns, but the Countess's penthouse vibe is just super dope, right? It's like super comfy, looks great. Um, and if you neon. look at the walls, I, I noticed this more this episode, just how the framing of the shots and everything, but the neon lights on both sides of the walls, I looked this up. One is, quote, you are not an artist, you just have big emotions. That's a fun one. And the other one is, why aren't we having sex right now? Uh, fitting for... <laughs> For the countess who just likes to devour, uh, you know, a bunch of, of subjects and have sex with them and then just kill them or turn them into vampires, um, but both of those are are done by a British artist uh, named Tracy Emin. I hope I'm pronouncing that correct. I'm probably not, but I just thought it was a really cool vibe to create in uh, uh, a timeless. You know, it feels kind of like 80s, 90s, but also uh, a very timeless mm -hmm. setting for someone who lives forever. You know. It's a little bit, they're trying to go for a little bit, maybe I, I'm assuming a little bit of Lost Boys with that uh, yeah. R.I.P. Schumacher, a little bit of that 80s uh, neon flash to it. Wanna be soldier, ginger ale. Back to the Hotel Cortez and John's at the bar with Liz. Liz says, hey, here's your ginger ale. And John says, nah, I want a double martini, okay. All right, he's drinking again. He's drinking again, that's right. And this is when things are going to get weird for John because let's say he hasn't had a drink since Holden's disappearance, right? That Which yep. is in 2010. It's been five, six plus years of him being dry. Ooh. And he's asking for a Ooh. double martini. I mean, he's going to get messed up off that. I, 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 if I don't drink a beer in a, in a week and I have one, then I, I, you know, I'm floating. Uh, so I can only imagine what he's going to do. Plus, he's in this hotel... Like, He's already in the Hotel Cortez. What are you doing getting a little Goodbye. intoxicated? I mean, it's going to get really weird for you, John. It doesn't take long for things to get weird because sitting right next to him is Eileen Warnos, played by the incredible Lily Rabe. Do I know you? I know. 
You ever picked up a hooker along I-95 in Florida? Now, the funny thing here to remember is, right, it's right around Halloween. So John doesn't know, you know, he doesn't believe that this would actually be the real Eileen Wernos because everyone's dressing up, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Like, like, he's like, <laughs> nice costume. This is great. This is cool. But, like, Eileen is like, no, 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 no. I'm, a I'm actually Eileen, Eileen sure. Wernos. Sure. Like, I'm sure. the, the sure actual serial killer okay. from Florida who, like, you know, worked as a sex worker and then killed, like, seven men in Florida, I believe all within like one year in, in the late 80s, early 90s. She was executed by lethal injection in October of 2002, and she was just the 10th woman in the US and the second in Florida to be executed since the 1976 United States Supreme Court decision restoring capital punishment. Um, obviously, if you've seen the movie Monster, Charlize Theron plays, uh, does an incredible job uh, as Eileen Wernos in that film. Wins an Academy Award. But also Lily Rabe, Lily Rabe literally, can I say, kills it? She kills it in this in this role. Ha 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 ha. Now from there, Eileen and John get into a little scruffle, which leads to uh, like a game of who's got the handcuffs on who. He puts, uh, he first he's locked up and then he knocks over Eileen, sends her to the bathroom, locks her up. Uh, with handcuffs and he goes downstairs to try to call the police to let them know what's going on but then yeah. liz quickly tells him no nah, this is devil's night none of this is gonna work and these are ghosts and oh guess what you're invited as well to marsh's devil's night soiree <laughs> and here's when we get another look at the guest list of who else is going to be at that party um, for devil's night so we you know you get the zodiac in there jeffrey dahmer john wayne gacy richard ramirez eileen wernos um, all hosted by James March, the, the you know the, the 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 top end of serial killers, the the master of serial killers, as they say. You know what's weird about that is you can probably go into any hotel, L.A. hotel, or maybe in New York too. If you look at their guest list, they may also put those crazy names on there. You may see like a Jeffrey Dahmer or, or uh, Eileen Wuornos on the guest list just to hide the celebrity or someone who's staying there. Uh, so yeah, it's a little nod to also that too, because you could probably on Halloween go to any hotel, maybe in Hollywood or in New York, and you'll see those names on there as well. Uh, Greg, that is go. wild for a celebrity to use a serial killer as an alias. It would that not shock me one bit crazy. if they do that. Nope, Which celebrity would most likely do that? Like Marilyn uh, Manson? Logan Paul. Logan Paul. Or, <laughs> Logan Paul would do that. Yeah, Logan something Paul like that. that. I'm not saying, I'm, I mean, YouTube celebrities, uh, probably. <laughs> so John goes back to the room to check in on Eileen, and of course she's missing. She's completely gone. She's She she got out of the handcuffs, and he's like, what the of hell? Course. But, you know, good news is that he has a tuxedo waiting for him and the invitation. So he's like, you know, what the hell? Might as well go check out this party. Um, and then he goes up to uh, room 78 for dinner. And guess what? March has a room full of serial killers hanging out together. Hey, John. Hey, listen, I, I want to apologize for what happened, man. And John Lowe still, I don't think he still doesn't believe what he sees. He thinks, mm -hmm. you know, it's just kind of a, uh, a Halloween party. Obviously, people dress up as various serial killers on Halloween. And he has no reason to believe, I mean, how could he? They're all deceased serial killers. Yeah. You know, why would he think that, that, that they're, act, they're actually real people? So he kind of sits down, well, against his own will, they all take their seats. And then we get a, a, a fun little introduction. Everyone does their own little, like, introduction on who mm -hmm. they are. Um, nope. And you get glimpse, glimpses into, like, you know, the backstory of some of these sadistic serial killers. Now, right before that, remember, John had already his double martini, and so right. to go with that, March uh, starts it off with uh, cheersing to absinthe. So, again, good luck, John, if this is, like, pure absinthe. Uh, yeah, this isn't that John, fake stuff. Uh-uh, so now he's in that chair just in a different world, in a different dimension at this point as they start doing, like, a roll call of all the serial killers who who's joined uh, March for this uh, soiree. So we already know Eileen Wernos is there. We also get John Wayne Gacy, played by the great John Carroll Lynch, who also played Twisty the Clown. Shout out to Pogo. Um, then we also get Jeffrey Dahmer. Um, and John recognizes, uh, obviously, uh, Rick, Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker himself, played uh -huh. by a different actor than who we see in 1984, obviously. A literal death watch. There are over 40 souls here. We all take turns. Um, but then we also get the Zodiac Killer in his in his black mask, his hiding mask, his identity. Yeah. 
um, walks in a little bit late. So you get this round table of serial killers that John comes face to face with, and he acts like he's gonna like take them all in, and they're all gonna go in cuffs with him, and he's gonna like you know he's 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 a cop, and he knows like the good thing to do, but he soon soon it becomes apparent that he has like no pull or no weight in this room. He he doesn't he can't do anything. What is this? Some kind of Halloween trick? What are you actors? I invited you here tonight to help you, John. They bring in a treat or something special for Jeffrey Dahmer, who uh, he's got his drill, and even uh, prior to him using the drill, I think uh, John tries to shoot him. Actually, he does shoot him, and again, Dahmer tells him the rules here. It's like, I'm dead, I'm a ghost, nothing's gonna work here. And then so at this point, John, he has no idea what's going on, he doesn't know what to believe, and then that's just where the, the fun really starts to kick in. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the minute that you shoot some someone and then you realize that nothing happens, like then John is is like, okay, um, maybe there's some yeah. supernatural stuff happening. And then remember, March also tells him like, you know, some pretty unrealistic things have been happening, uh, and you've seen them you've seen them with your own eyes throughout the, your stay at the Hotel Cortez. So he's mm-hmm. kind of being um, slowly kind of led to believe that maybe there's a possibility. That some of this thing that his, that his that his eyes are seeing that are actually true, and that is not just kind of make believe. But remember, he's had a few drinks here, so no matter what, he's probably gonna go wipe this off and go, eh, whatever. It was just my in my head for the moment. That's a good point. You know, a double martini plus some absinthe. I mean, you're hallucinating probably, and that's some pure pure absinthe. I'm I'm sure. So, um, you know, you really can't trust your instincts in this situation, right? You have no idea what's going on. Um, yep. I will say that drill scene, it reminded me, Greg, eerily of that horrific nail gun scene that you and I watched yep. in AHS Same. Colt. Um, this one might have been, I don't even know it's worse. They're both horrible. It's like a Hannibal, yeah, Hannibal Lecter kind of call out vibe yeah. I got from that. Red dragon crap. Ooh. Totally. Like drills a hole into his head and then pours acid into the into his brain. Yeah. This, <sighs> okay. He's not dead. He's the undead. I made him a zombie when I poured the acid in his brain. Now, March calls them the Mount Rushmore of murder. Um, and so he's apparently, he's been advising them and coaching them uh, for years. I know they wanted to shoot this, but they probably didn't have enough time to do a montage of him like in different time periods, talking yeah. to each of them, like some kind of like like a, a Disney sports movie, like <laughs> Matthew McConaughey's The Coach, one of those things or, or anything down the line for either like Denzel Washington. He's just like coaching them through their murders. I know they wanted to oh, shoot God. that, but they didn't have time. <laughs> yeah, they'd be a little bit dark to go through to each one of their backstories and show March just coaching them on. Now, at one point, Eileen and Ricky, a.k.a. Richard Ramirez, they uh, turn on some music and they dance to Sweet Jane. Um, that is an homage to, if you've seen Natural Born Killers, which came out in 1994. Um, that's a very gruesome movie. Um, yes, it is. But uh, they they kind of dance along to that to that song in that film mm-hmm. as well. So a, a nice little homage to the homage to that movie. Um, now these two serial killers actually in real life they share the same birthday, um, February 29th, which is an, a very eerie coincidence right there. Um, but you know everyone at this point in the episode they're just kind of having literally a party as as we mentioned. Um, and John is kind of just in a daze, just watching everything happen. I mean, can you imagine if you just like you saw all this going on in a room and you're completely helpless. Um, yeah, like, there's John Wayne Gacy as a clown. What is what is happening here? I would have been out cold at that point. <laughs> yeah, and then we see, you know, Sally, Sally, uh, you know, kind of talking with this businessman who's uh, traveling to L- L.A. For, for on a business trip. Uh-huh. And she brings him up to the room and they all basically kind of just do a sacrifice, a human sacrifice, and they all just kill him together. Um, mm-hmm. And at this point, this is when kind of reality, uh, the the lines of reality is kind of blurred, right? Because then we see John kind of wake up or flash, he sees flash forwards to Sally just waking him up in an empty room mm-hmm. that has looked like it's been deserted for years, decades even. Um, and she says, you know, of course, oh, have you been drinking tonight? Um, and you're led to believe fake. that, hey, maybe this is all fake. Maybe it's all made up. Maybe it's all in his head. Mm-hmm. But nope. 
Now, what the whole thing with Sally going to the Devil's Night party is when she dropped off that guy, she did note that this gives her another year of uh, basically being unbothered at the hotel, whatever that means. But she's now got a full clear year so as long as she keeps giving them bodies on Devil's Night, apparently. Yeah, that, that, that's that's a good call. I mean, it makes sense because we see that she kind of roams. She kind of comes in and out of the different rooms uh, and mm -hmm. pops into the, the, you know, and she seems like she doesn't have like that much. Um, she's not like overly powerful compared to some of the other ghosts in the hotel, but they kind of leave her alone. And now we kind of know why, right? She's really good at kind of seducing and recruiting all of these sacrifices, all these fresh blood for all these different, um, you know, spirits throughout the hotel. So obviously she made an arrangement with March at some point that says, hey, I'll keep on doing this and I'll be loyal to you and you just kind of le let me be and let me do my own thing. One last thing about that Devil's Night party, John Wayne Gacy jokes about uh, Johnny Depp loving his work. Mm -hmm. And in real life, Johnny Depp does in fact own a painting by John Wayne Gacy. Okay. Yeah, I guess there is like a some sort of market for serial killers that um, have you of know, course you know, oh of art. course there is yeah, yeah I don't know <laughs> I don't know why one would buy that but that's that's pretty ridiculous I, I think I, I I read further that Johnny Depp he might not own it now but at some point like you said he did own it and I think that he also sell that stuff he also owned or might have owned um, at some point some Charles Manson art as well who also did did some art while he was um, imprisoned I believe um, but yeah just like a, an ear an eerily, what a what a weird and eerie thing to have like hanging in your collection. And to close things out in the final scene, we get Alex and the Countess, where the Countess manages to convince uh, Alex uh, about the you know what it's going to take to get back Holden, and she convinces her to turn her into a vampire. It happens, and we we have a scene literally where. Uh, the cameras go upside down, you know, to represent, you know, Alex's life is officially turning upside down now. And also as well, since they're upside down and they're on the ceiling uh, and she's a vampire, then bats. And I'm just going to go with that because, of course, you know, like my that. favorite TV show right now. And we could just play out to that. <laughs> I like that. No, I like that. Um, I'm going to walk home. <laughs> Why the hell would you do that? Why would you walk home when you could turn into a bat? All right, guys, that'll do it for us this week. We, of course, will be back next week for episode five of American Horror Story Hotel. It is called Room Service. We'll see you then. Bye-bye, everybody. Take care.